Good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Okwe Enwezo. I'm the director of House of Kunst, and it gives me, <laughs> of course, I have to introduce myself. You never know. <laughs> it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening for you know, what I hope will be uh, an informative and stimulating discussion with our guest, Adam Chimchik, who needs no introduction, but is currently the artistic director of Documenta 14. And for me, um, welcoming Adam here um, is doubly um, important, not only because of his connection, the shared connection we have with Documenta, but because of my deep admiration um, for Adam's work as a curator over um, the last two decades. Um, I think that the idea of curating an exhibition like Documenta um, is interesting in many ways, not just simply because of the, the scope and the scale and the challenge of putting together um, a major ex exhibition of global importance, but because of the time it takes to build such an exhibition, that the, the duration for the preparation um, of document, uh, an exhibition like Documenta is very different from that of preparing a biennial, which has a different temporality and certainly the curator's metabolism is different. And so this in many ways makes Documenta you know, very special and special in the sense that it's an intellectual project that has an exhibition frame rather than just simply an exhibition frame into which you put things. It's a, it's, it's a context that in, inhabits ideas. And, and for this reason, I think the project that Adam is preparing um, you know, for many of us will be illuminating in many ways because Adam has worked with that intellectual frame rather than just simply the artistic or the exhibition frame. And we'll talk a little bit about this um, in the course of the evening. But let me just say that um, that before Adam got to Castle, he had already established a formidable um, you know, backdrop of exhibitions and of course programs as, as a thinker of the contemporary. He was a co-founder of the Foxo Gallery Foundation in Warsaw where he worked as a curator from 1997 you know, through 2003. And before he assumed the position as the director of the uh, Kunsthalle Basel. And uh, you know, for many of us who go to Basel annually, the Kunsthalle is always the place that you stop by to, again, to engage with some of the thinking. Um, and in Basel, he organized numerous exhibitions, I think, to start listing all the exhibitions in a period of, um, of, you know, of the period of time um, that he was there um, would really not do justice to what he accomplished while he was in Basel. But Adam also has cur you know, co curated with Elena Filipovich um, the fifth you know, Berlin Biennial for Contemporary Arts under the title 
when things cast no shadow. And in 2012, he curated Olenka, or where movement is created at Museo Tamayo in Mexico City. He's a member of the board of many um, places, including um, Museum of Modern Art in Warsaw. And in 2011, um, he was awarded the Walter Hobbs you know, Award for Curatorial Achievement at the Menil Foundation in Houston. Um, so please help me welcome Adam. And um, I look forward to um, a stimulating evening. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for, for your invitation, Okui. It's a pleasure and honor to say a few words about Documenta 14 here in Munich at the Haus der Kunst, which was inaugurated, as we know, in 1933. And at that time, um, Arnold Bode, the founder of Documenta, had already done a couple of exhibitions of contemporary art. He co-organized a number of exhibitions of which not that much is um, they are not very famous, let's say. They are not famous as documenta. Um, but nevertheless, uh, Arnold Bode in the late 20s and early 30s co-organized exhibitions of the so-called Kassel Recession, for instance. So a number of artists who would then be featured in the first uh, documenta in 1955 already appeared in these exhibitions that, uh, um, that Bode co-organized before 1933. And in 1933, this building was inaugurated and Arnold Bore's career was interrupted for quite a period of time. Um, among other things, he also lost his studio and his work. He was an artist, not only an exhibition organizer. And in strange ways, uh, buildings and individual fates and exhibitions are always interrelated. And I think um, in Documenta 14 we will try to look a little into um, the period not before 1933, which, is, um, which was the ambition of the first Documenta to kind of bring back the state of things before 1933 and look at modern art again. But we would like to look at into the period between 1933 and 1945, or perhaps 1948. Perhaps 1948, which is the year when, when uh, the, the new German mark was, was introduced. And it was introduced through a meeting that took place nearby Kassel in the woods, in the military barracks that survived the war. A number of specialists in what I think it's called in German, in Finanzwesen, the, um, the, the, the people with experience uh, in, in banks and other financial institutions uh, brought together by the French, British, and Americans um, were kind of locked in a building in a place called Rodwesten in Kassel, and they were deliberating for several weeks how to um, introduce the currency reform that was very important because it allowed actually to uh, think about um, implementing the, the Marshall Plan. Uh, once you had a currency, you could s start with economic recovery, and indeed it happened. So the history of post-war Germany is um, linked to Kassel in more ways than just through documenta, and I, I found it interesting that Kassel provides somehow a lot of um, things to uh, th think about when um, when we began we're working on <coughs> Documenta in 2014 and actually already in 2013. In November 2013, I was n uh, nominated artistic director of Documenta 14, following a proposal I had formulated in the summer of that year on the invitation of the International Search Committee. Um, and my proposition then, in 2013, was to unfold Documenta 14 
in 2017 in two subsequent and partly overlapping iterations, both involving the same artists and other participants in two cities, Athens and Kassel. And this is, this is more or less what is happening, happening now. I think it's going to happen. Um, uh, in the beginning of April, the exhibition opens in Athens, and then in the beginning of June, it opens in, in Kassel. So it's like uh, two takes, uh, like in jazz, for instance. Since the activities of Documenta 14 in Athens and Kassel became gradually visible in 2015, we have been immersed in the city that has become emblematic of global contemporary crisis. In Athens, the actual hardship of daily life is mixed with the humiliating stigma of crisis imprinted on the com communal body in a well-known pseudo-compassionate moralizing and in its essence neo-colonial and neoliberal formula. At the same time, the decision to turn Documenta 14 into a divided self, a decidedly anti-identitarian stance, was impaired somehow by the initial operational inability of the castle-based enterprise of Documenta to act in a full-scale manner outside of Documenta's hometown. So it took quite a while before we could actually really start working in Athens because Documenta is so bound to Castle that uh, we had a lot of difficulties to resolve, but I think we are at the point when, when they are indeed resolved and the exhibition can take place. So while working on Documenta 14, we have attempted to abandon the pre-formatted idea of of Documenta as yet another 100-day-long iteration of the most renowned and debated contemporary art exhibition worldwide, which is a formulation that, that has been appearing in the many existing versions of Documenta's own uh, in introduction as an institution. So it's kind of this self-aggrandizing uh, manner of Documenta declaring itself already the most important exhibition without, I mean, taking it for granted was something that we tried to question from the beginning. And this relocation, or rather bilocation, so the exercise in physical impossibility of being in uh, two different places at the same time was, was the essence of the project. Um, our aim and interest has been in turning Documenta 14 into a continuum of aesthetic, economic, political, and social experimentation. During the period from 2013 until 2017, we, we have witnessed both locally and globally the implementation of debt as political measure, the gradual destruction of what remained of the welfare state, wars waged for resources and the markets, and the resulting multiple and never-ending humanitarian, humanitarian cat catastrophes. Um, this darkening global situation has leaned heavily upon our daily and nightly thinking about and acting on and for Documenta 14. Foremost among the catastrophes that we have encountered as we have worked on Documenta 14 has been the economic violence enacted, as it seems, almost experimentally upon the population of Greece, brought about by subsequent phases of austerity measures imposed by international financial institutions in unison with European Union leaders, such measures have resulted in the de facto loss of sovereignty of the current and any future Greek political constituency, as well as the loss of Greek citizens' individual freedoms after capital control instruments were implemented in 2015. Alongside and entangling this social collapse has been the disastrous war in Syria and the continuing arrival of refugees by land and sea to Greece, and southern Europe, and finally, the dark rise of, of authoritarian rule, right-wing populism, and fascism across the continent and the world at large. As we grappled and engaged through the project of Documenta 14 with these discouraging events that came to shape our lives in the second decade of the 21st century, we also began to slowly recognize the paradoxical nature of the enterprise called Documenta, an elusive and haunting apparition. It's a phantom of sorts that is never to be precisely located, existing in and between Documenta's 13 consecutive iterations that have taken place since its inception as a paradigm-setting contemporary art exhibition in 1955 in Kassel. Yet, in its presence as both a diachronic time-space, 
dramatic arc comprised of all past documentas and a singular episode that yet needs to be realized, documenta offers the possibility of breaking through the circles of repetition. As such, it is a good starting point for reflection on the contemporary condition of actually existing neoliberalism, that placeless and faceless formation and its varied apparatuses that have come to define the existence of all peoples living on the planet today within the general framework of coloniality. Accordingly, Documenta also remains an excellent vessel through which to think about the role cultural production is typically, typically bound to play in this seemingly seamlessly constructed system of production and consumption, aesthetic perusal and investment, and our specific functions within it as cultural producers. The functions, that is, that are defined at the outset of such an international exhibition, those of invited artists, the team organizing the show, and the expected spectators, all three isolated categories sustaining and embodying the exhibitionary complex, uh, according to formulation of Tony Bennett, in question. <coughs> Since its founding, Documenta has gone through a series of modifications at both the curatorial and organizational level, uh, which can be explained um, if we look at the backdrop of larger global developments against which uh, the subsequent editions have been mounted and in which Europe has remained a central reference. Even if the Eurocentric model and thinking has come to be repeatedly questioned since Documenta 10, organized by Catherine David in 1997, the mid-20th century ideological fruit of the Marshall Plan and the post-war United States-backed German economic recovery, which was paralleled by the state-orchestrated moral reconstruction of German society after Nazi rule came to an end, Documenta has since become one of the most recognized names and most anticipated events of contemporary art world. Assuming the role of its conscience, with each edition of Documenta mirroring, witnessing, and fiercely commenting on its time. In its triple function as mirror, witness, and com commentator, Documenta's main tenet and international contemporary art exhibition taking place in Kassel has remained mostly un unchanged um, despite the many decisive historical turns that have happened along the way. These include the end of Cold War, the lasting, lasting outcome of the New World Order established after the Axis was defeated in World War II, and Documenta's proper living environment through its first eight editions. With the fall of the Berlin Wall and the reunification of Germany, if the Cold War's close led to the loss of Kassel's strategic position on the eastern flank of the West, and the subsequent remaking and remapping of Europe, it also had consequences for the world order and allowed the international art market to expand alongside other markets. Moreover, after the first Gulf War, the trauma of 9-11 and the war in Iraq, the stiffening embrace of neoliberal economy has come to exert its power on a global scale. It has brought about the crisis that first manifested itself in the United States, housing market crash 2007, reached Greece 2008, and since then has kept the country in its cold grip. As if by common tacit agreement within the European, European family of nations, which in the meantime found themselves falling into a political and social vertigo that seriously undermined contemporary Western democracies. All of this has occurred despite the fact that the neocolonial, patriarchal, and heteronormative order of power and discourse, which is precisely the hegemonic order supporting the neoliberal war machine today, has long been the primary target of critical analysis and emancipatory action. Such analysis and action has been embodied in the anti-colonial liberation movements around the globe after World War II, as well as by a multitude of anti-authoritarian rights movements, including feminist and queer movements, and in critical philosophy, as well as voiced by radical artistic practices internationally for, for at least the past half century. Yet, as of today, this visibly deteriorating, yet still enormously dangerous and ever self-adjusting world order, a complex entanglement of political and military powers that globally uphold the exploits of financial capitalism while keeping intact the old and untenable concept of a world comprised of sovereign nation states, is an inescapable framework that must be addressed anew in order to understand our current circumstances. Indeed, the result of the recent presidential elections in the US leaves little hope for those who might believe that the course of empire and those profiteers and slavers who have steered it will change anytime soon. Yet, such is not sufficient reason to give up trying. The 14th edition of Documenta um, 
The 14th time around, with Documenta, things will take a, another course. At the time of writing uh, of these remarks, the inauguration is scheduled in Athens April 8th and Castle June 10th. So indeed, the total time of Documenta in both cities will span 163 days of constant journeying back and forth between these two somewhat distant, in all senses of the word, locations. The classic time-space action unity of an exhibition is thus profoundly called into question here. Repetition and the retake lurk near, disrupting expectations of a singular beginning and a definitive ending. Opening up the space and time of a continuum of one exhibition in two cities over a period of time and beginning well before the scheduled opening, opening date with a multitude of actors joining to constitute what we have been referring to as public dimension of the project. Documenta 14 is comprised of its making, its experience, its discussion and its possible continuations. Art is a physical as much as it is a mental experience. It's not an abstract demonstration of conditions that can be deployed in any context. Contrary to the illusions of global accessibility and undistinguishable sameness of being that we are induced to believe by the marketing strategies of global capital and optimistic narrations of failing mainstream politics, the place and, and the time matter. Nevertheless, at the same time, we are experiencing painfully limited mobility and drastic restrictions of individual freedoms. In such a context, it makes sense to initiate the 14th iteration of Documenta by moving, by moving it from its current location on to the margins of the European Economic Power Center, uh, to, to the city that was once one of the central meeting points of the Mediterranean world, and with it, the proverbial cradle of that same European civilization that has reached its present state of exhaustion. Even in the midst of what many see as a downfall, heralding the imminent fate of other countries in the hitherto prosperous West, Athens located forever between cultures, connecting three continents and holding multitudes, remains the nexus of challenges and transformations that the entire continent is now experiencing. Thus, it seemed most pertinent to work and act from Athens, where we might begin to learn how to see the world again in an unprejudiced way, unlearning and abandoning the predominant cultural conditioning that silently or explicitly presupposes the supremacy of the West, its institutions and culture, over the barbarian and supposedly untrustworthy, unable, unenlightened, ever to be subjugated rest. By bringing indigenous practices and techniques of knowledge from all over the world via Athens to Castle and elsewhere, we aim to question this very supremacist, white and male, nationalist, colonialist way of being and thinking that continues to construct and dominate the world order. Despite the militant empowering call Forget Fear, formulated by the artist Artus Mijewski in 2012 as the title of his seventh Berlin Biennial, the world as we know it today reminds a place and time of mostly fear, not hope. Indeed, fear is the common currency of neoliberalism, precisely because it can be more easily capitalized on the, than desire and unbound joy. If it has become progressively more difficult to risk any prediction of a future, not to mention explaining it to the next generation, these facts of contemporary existence do not seem in the least to bother those in positions of power. The will to power of politicians who have no vision to offer and no means to implement it has upset people's belief in democracy based on the idea of elected representation of the people. The old political parties around the globe, whether social democratic, liberal or conservative, have let down their voters by abandoning most of what was once believed to be their founding principles. In order to, by agreement, continue naturalizing the ever widening gap between the rich and poor, the educated and uneducated, whites and people of color, men and women, the heteronormative and LGBTQ communities. This gap, or gulf rather, has resulted in blatant acts of exclusion followed by shame, frustration and fear, as well as the awakening of rage of many people on this planet. Indeed, such democracy recently brought to an office an array of reactionary populist or simply dictatorial governments around the world with fascism creeping near, and there is no end to this process in sight. On the contrary, we see again at work the well-known perverse instrumentalization of war as a way of boosting national economies and a false sense of citizens' togetherness through violent conflict on remote and near testing grounds. Among them, most notably in Syria, where the war engaging the global superpowers and regional players has wrought 
endless destruction of the local civilian population and prompted a humanitarian disaster and crisis of humanity, often comfortably but falsely called the refugee crisis. We live in a dangerous moment, one in which democracy must be thought anew, reinvented, instead of just being disposed of, which can easily happen when authoritarian thinking prevails over the participatory models. Too easily and much too often, the recent answer to the deficiencies of democracy has been a form of autocratic rule veiled in democratic procedures, first securing control over military and surveillance apparatuses, then taking on administration, education, media, cultural production, and so on. In Europe, we have seen it occurring in Russia, Hungary, Poland, and Turkey. We may soon see the great European nations of the West turning in this direction as well. The move of Documenta to Athens in order to unlearn what we know and not to give its people lessons is meant to open up a space of possibility. The old world is based on concepts of belonging, identity, and rootedness. Our world, ever new, will be one of radical subjectivities. The search for lost origins, the disentangling of confused selves, coming to terms with uprooted identities and statelessness, keep us busy and leave no time and space for life, suspending us in a state of misery, constantly imperiled and daily violated by warmongering, economic and environmental damage, to entire peoples, supported by egoism and privileging individual profit-making, dressed in the garb of entrepreneurial spirit. It seems an accusation, yet it cannot find its addressee. The collective and historical we of Western civilization, our unstoppable conquest of territory and insatiable hunger for the dissemination of our ways of being, sometimes misleadingly called ideals, as in the German romanticism of the Athenaeum journal, which became, according to Jean-Luc Nancy and Philippe Lacoulabart, the first avant-garde movement in Europe at the end of 18th century. So this conquest and this hunger for dissemination of our ways of being have led us to the point where we might seriously think about decreasing rather than increasing. There is nowhere to go. The world has become known and ends here. Yet, artists may show us a way toward, le toward learning to learn from below, as Gayatri Ch Ch Chakravorty Spivak terms it, or as Suleiman Bashir Diagne puts it, learning from others in order to live together. Learning from them, we can imagine a symmetrical situation of the encounter of equals and not an asymmetrical power relationship between the sovereign and the subalterns. Artists, meaning writers, filmmakers, sculptors, painters, musicians, actors, and all those once excluded from entering the Republic can teach us that we must first learn to become strangers to ourselves and thus undergo a decreation, as per Simon Weil, uh, instead of sustaining overproduction. They can show us how to shake the foundations of our positive and passive understanding of the world, teach us how to abandon the cities and then inhabit the cities again. Castle and Athens are cases in point. And how to care about the way in which we work and what we do with the fruits of our labors. These questions have been formulated within the Western field of the arts since 19th century realism and the 20th century radical avant-garde and post-war neo-avant-garde, targeting the reactionary politics, supporting the buildup of capitalism and colonialism through all its different terms. Progressive artistic forces rejected the bourgeois acceptance for the creation of art only as long as it remained decoration, subject of aesthetic delectation or prop in rituals of representation of state or corporate power. Artists remained aware of the threat of instant recuperation of criticality by the spectacle, that which is the visible mask of capital, until today, when the consolidation of capitalist domination globally seems accomplished and the generalized necropolitics, as per Achille Mbembe, of the modern war machines of the global neocolonial enterprise have finally supplanted the biopolitical power embodied in the founding of the repressive institutions of European modernity, from mental asylum through school, brothel, prison, and concentration camp. We live in societies where control has, beca has become the ultimate goal, where potential or actual state repression is used as a tool 
to constantly produce and reproduce fear experienced by society's subject as a necessary component that permeates our being in the world. Control and its attendant other, fear, has become an indispensable part of us. We carry it within, internalized, rather than experience it as an external incursion. Okay, uh, let me stop here. Okay. <laughs> Wow, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you so much, um, Adam. That is quite a statement of intent. Um, and I think um, in many ways um, one can say, you know, reflecting from 2013, when you put together your proposal, that there is a kind of anticipatory dimension to um, your documenta. If not necessarily prophetic, is proven to become prophetic in the sense that the, the crisis in Greece happened and the refugee crisis, the Brexit and, um, you know, he who shall remain unnamed also uh, happened to us. So all of that put together, I, I, I sort of want to, you know, to go to, to begin our conversation, um, you know, from the point of view of um, your early presentation, your, your beginning with Arnold Borde. Mm -hmm. Borde in 1920s, up until 33, the exhibitions he made. And of course, Bode, the, the figure, you know, who not only gave his documenta, but to re help reestablish the academy in Kassel yes. after the war. But what I want to say, you know, to ask is because Bode as a figure for us is very central. There's a kind of utopian dimension to Bode's project. And you invoke Bode, this return um, of this figure um, and dealing with history, dealing with contemporary history. And I want to, sort of to ask you, looking from your time, what do you see as the responsibility of the curator, of documenta, if we're to bring Bode and you into this equation? Mm. I, saw, I saw the mm, declaration of in, intent of Lawrence Winner on the wall of your house earlier, <laughs> somewhere, which says, among other things, that uh, the work m m may, may be fa fabricated. Right. So, and it may not be fabricated. Not be fabricated. <laughs> that's, that's interesting thing with statements of, of intent, that they introduce this contingency or a gap. Um, between the, the idea and the realization of idea that is somehow contingent upon the intention of the receiver. The receiver is the maker, is half of the work. So for us, it was important to consider visitors not, as, uh, not in terms of their numbers, but in terms of their potential co collective power. If documenta is visited by a million people, it's quite impressive number. They don't come all at once, but over time, and I, I was wondering how, how it could be possible to somehow transform this um, this presence into some form of action rather than uh, than into a kind of passive mode of reception. So this is something that definitely interests us. To your question concerning responsibility, I think it's a responsibility towards all the individuals who are participating from the visitors to the artists through the organizers i guess um, and uh, a larger responsibility i think um, i i have an impression that Bode was at that time looking into a future but he did so by uh, reaching into into the past over the period when contemporary or mo modern art could not be uh, shown and practiced in Germany. 
he tried to um, to 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 bring again um, the traditions of avant-garde into play, and the Haus der Kunst followed a very similar. I mean, the the artists who showed in the, the work in the first documenta are exactly the same artists who had exhibition in the Haus der Kunst in the from the late 40s to through the 50s. So there's a kind of common agreement that uh, at that time that. Uh, you know, the Georges Braque and Fernand Leger will be these artists who will be then, you know, pillars of the new society, mm -hmm. strangely. And uh, it's, a, it's a pretty Euro, Europocentric um, view of things that gets them questions, uh, not the least through your documenta. And <laughs> <laughs> this is the kind of uh, obligation, I would say, uh, since 1997, that each uh, curator of, uh, of documenta has to, um, it's like a, f like an attempt to, to repay or to, um, to, s to stand to this obligation, I suppose, of seeing things in, in a way that is not following the, the, the pattern as it is taking shape, things as they are simply. Mm. I guess. Well, I wanted to ask you, you know, for an exhibition that takes, you know, a little bit of time to 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 put together. Um, you know, whether you know, how do you sustain not becoming bored with putting together the exhibition? You know, because of the the period of gestation um, means that. Um, you know, if we look at previous documentaries, it was always the, at the place where you, 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 you know, exhibitions where you go to take a temperature of the, of the zeitgeist, so to speak. And if you have such a long period to make the exhibition, um, how do you escape, you know, that possibility of becoming untimely? Yeah? So, this, because I think that's what really haunts Documenta, this struggle not to be untimely. Because the, the expectation oftentimes is that you know, the, the exhibition announces that which is to come. And, and I'm wondering how you've, you know, you've kind of hinted at this, because it seems like your project has a historical dimension. And we'll yet get to these three volumes, which in many ways I would argue is your exhibition hiding in plain sight because you re refuse to give the list of artists? Yes, I, I like the word uh, untimely. It, ha it has a tra tradition in the German language too. Unzeitgemäß, um, not of its time, mm. um, which, which I think relates to, to the notion of con contemporary is something that apparently is supposed to be in line with its time or intimately bound to its time or representing some kind of zeitgeist. But in fact, contemporary can be also interpreted as exactly untimely, as, as something that in a positive sense uh, tries to, to, to break away from, from, the, from the moment in which it is inserted. And the intention in 2013 was not so much to look back um, but to, to, to imagine the, uh, the years to come. And as, as you said, it was... I'll continue, I'll continue. It was, uh, it was back then, 2013, possible to see the shape of things to come, but uh, we could not imagine how fast and how complete uh, it, it, it will become. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> the magazine. Um... No, we're going to come to the magazine. Yeah. Uh, we're going to come to the magazine, but I, I just, you know, I, I just wanted to mention it, you know, because the the, the process of Documenta already started with the series of publications of uh, this magazine uh, South. There will be four in total, mm -hmm. and um, three editions have been, you know, issued. And so, in, in a sense, you've kind of answered the question of how you've occupied your time. So there's uh, a great deal of work that is really unfolding. And I will say to everybody, 
Um, th th this first issue is sold out in our bookshop, but the other two are available, um, not many. But I, w I, w I should say that going through, um, you know, you know, the, 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 the magazines kind of, you know, reflected the the way in which one intellectually occupies the time it takes to make documenta because there is an incredible luxury, you know, to that. An incredible luxury that perhaps is also related to neoliberalism. And I wonder how we reconcile, you know, the 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 resources afforded us to to think, you know, to make this work and to square it with the uh, you know, the kind of predatory nature of neoliberalism. Because it's, it's, it's a paradox, isn't it? You know, that um, you are precisely working to escape, you know, this structure, but at the same time, you are embedded in it because of the resources afforded you, that, you know, the time is, a, is an extreme luxury in this sense. Mm -hmm. Yes, but it's it's given to you only for a limited period of time. So you don't have all time. You have a you have a period of three years, and you have to do something that makes sense within that period. Mm -hmm. So I think um, I wouldn't I wouldn't reject the luxury of having this time, especially that apart from making the magazine, it's filled with so many other activities um, of let's say organizational nature mainly. And um, I, I think the danger here is rather to become indifferent than, than become bored. Um, it, it, it is interesting, but after a while, um, the work on the exhibition might turn into, um, in, yeah, it, it, it becomes difficult at certain point to, um, to relate to the work and to, to practices in the same way as as you, as you did when you started. Mm. So you have to somehow keep your promise and deliver the exhibition, mm. but you are um, racing with time against your own uh, indifference or becoming indifferent. I, I, rem I remember you know, the similar process of writing my own proposals, submitting it, defending it, and you know, getting the job, and then, you know, life happens. You know, it's a proposal, and then the world happens. And, and, and I'm wondering, you know, from the time you, 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 you presented your initial ideas, um, what has changed from the first proposal? What have you added to the project? How has it, you know, been reshaped? And, um, and, you know, how has life, in a sense, all the things that have happened subsequently, affected your basic thesis? Has the thesis remained the same? Has it shifted? Has it been restructured to accommodate or to let other modes of thinking inhabit it? Mm -hmm. um. I think we've been trying to, um, to rather implement some parts, at least, of the original concept. And one important part is that we engage in collaborations in Athens with mostly, with, with quite many public funded institutions, which at the moment means that uh, these institutions are collapsing because the public funding for, for culture um, doesn't really um, well, I wouldn't say it doesn't exist, but it, it's, it's, it's very difficult to, uh, to run an institution such as museum, for instance, in, in Athens. And our hope was that Documenta will not create a constellation of venues, but rather um, articulate uh, possibilities of different in institutions that are uh, still present in Athens, such as the Museum of Contemporary art, which has been a project since I think over 10 years now and which still cannot open due to the lack of funds, mostly. So we are very much hoping to be able to um, to show uh, quite a lot of work 
by a document of 14 artists in this museum. Um, and other institutions, uh, public institutions in, in Athens. So that definitely didn't, didn't change. It was an intention to um, work with, the, with this kind of public sector, um, not so much uh, with private funded, uh, uh, let's say, initiatives or, or with foundations that are present in Athens and somehow replace this public sector to a degree. Um, on the other hand, um, there were some um, parts, not of, of the original concept, but um, of what appeared later, and namely the whole idea of including the so-called Gurlit estate in, in the project, which had to be by necessity modified. I think the, the so-called Gurlit estate is still uh, somewhere in, near Munich, probably in the storage, and it will remain there for some months, and most likely to not be included in Documenta 14. But there are ways of, uh, of let's say, showing it without uh, physically um, including it in the exhibition. Um, so we are still working around the idea of uh, concealed estate um, consisting of works um, acquired, collected, uh, hoarded by Hildebrand Gurlitt uh, in the 1930s and 1940s, and even um, also collected earlier already. Um, so this was one of the um, elements that drove the process of making a part of the exhibition in Kassel, for instance. So um, there is, yeah. How, so, you know, two, two locations, because they're not venues, two locations. So you, you talk about bilocation, or one can say bifurcation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's this, you know, you know crack in, 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 in the body of what we've understood to be documented in terms of castle. And I wonder if you can talk about, you know, you know what, what the differences between the two, you know, locations between Castle and Athens. You know, if you can sort of help us imagine, um, you know, physically, you know, how the exhibitions will be articulated uh, in Castle and in in Athens, and if you already sort of know what the venues will be uh, in mm -hmm. both places. Yes, um, in uh, in Kassel, uh, we hope the exhibition will be will be concentrated uh, in maybe two areas uh, areas mostly. Like on the one hand, uh, the Friedrichsplatz and its surroundings, uh, so kind of uh, traditional place of Documenta with Friedrichsplatz and so so forth. But the square itself is also becoming uh, important for the exhibition. So what is happening on, on the square, the kind of activities uh, that will be taking place there, together with um, construction of the Parthenon of, of Books by Marta Minuchin, that should begin quite soon. Um, in Athens, well, Athens is, is a metropolis with uh, something what, like what is the, What is the, uh, the, six second, million the second part? You know, you say you have the Friedrich Plus, and then, you know, that area with Friedrichsianum, and is there another location in Castle? Yes, the northern part. The northern part, okay. Northern part. Okay. The, <laughs> the northern <laughs> part of, of the city, <laughs> which, is, which is somehow uh, for many a kind of no-go zone. This part of the city was used during the documenta uh, of uh, curated by Roger Burgel and Ruth Noack for, for instance, for the presentation of the work by Artus Mijewski and Hito Steyl in Schlachthof, mm -hmm. uh, which is a kind of cultural and social center in in that part of the city. So, I think we are we are going to try to bring the audience to Friedrichsplatz, but not along the Treppenstrasse, but through a kind of Darker and le less, uh, yes, slightly more complicated route uh, mm. through other areas. So you would arrive in Friedrichsplatz somehow from the side of K 
Koenigsplatz probably um, from there. And Koenigsplatz became somehow paradigmatic location for me, if I may borrow this yellow. yellow can, can you turn first, on the, 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 can we see the images, please? First issue. Um, since the magazine is out of print, I will probably not bore you to uh, re reading something from, from Goethe, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, from his lesser known uh, oeuvre called The Campaign in France in the year 1792. Um, so in, in this diary of the campaign, uh, Goethe writes, gloomy, however, as were my thoughts in the last and darkest of the nights, they were suddenly brightened up when I drove into Kassel, lit up by myriads of lamps. At this sight, my mind was vividly impressed with a sense of the advantages possessed by the inhabitants of large towns when I saw the comfort of each individual citizen in his own well-lit dwelling and the commodious establishments for the reception of strangers. The cheerfulness produced by this was disturbed for a time when we arrived in the splendidly illuminated square, the Königsplatz, where it was a, as light as day and we stopped before the well-known inn there. For the servant who announced our arrival returned with the answer that there was no room for us. But on seeing that I did not go away, one of the servants stepped up very civilly to the carriage window and, with some fine phrases in French, begged me to excuse them as it was quite impossible to take me in. I replied in good German that I could not help being surprised that in so large a building, the extent of which was well known to me, a stranger should be refused admittance in the night. You are a German, he exclaimed. That is quite another affair. And the postilion was immediately told to drive into the courtyard. After showing me a good room, he added that he was quite determined not to admit any more of the emigrants. Their behavior was most presumptuous, and they pay niggardly, for in the midst of all their wretchedness and not knowing where to turn, they still conducted themselves as if they had taken possession of a conquered country. So this is Goethe in 1792, and uh, you know, having stumbled upon this uh, bite of text, I could not, not think about this, this beautiful photographs from 1948 when Jonas Mekas, who is now over 90 years old and lives in New York, um, was actually a, in a displaced person comes Mattenberg uh, in uh, nearby Kassel in what is now the suburbs <coughs> of Kassel. So these this stories of strangers um, coming to Kassel, they, uh, they repeat, they recur. And what we are seeing now is, is yet another turn of that same story. So we're going to look into that in the exhibition quite okay. a bit. Okay, and Athens? <laughs> oh, At Athens is a, it's a big city. Um, <laughs> in the middle of the city, the, uh, there is a rock. And this rock has been an object of desire and the locus of uh, symbolic projections and sort of retro projections of th this German nation who, among other things, build a Valhalla in the shape of Parthenon. So I think ad addressing Parthenon and addressing Athens and especially addressing the neoclassicism as costume of any power, mm. be it in Germany or in any other country, uh, also um, the buildings of colonial administration all over the world and all that, all, all that is neoclassical, so we're going to look into how the neoclassical uh, was constructed as a language, and uh, we are. This conversation is, of course, taking place in the building that owes a lot to Leo von Klenze and the likes. Uh, I think 
undoing the neo neoclassic uh, aesthetics is uh, again quite pertinent. I think it has to be right in the middle of Athens. Can you imagine that? <laughs> yes, uh, I, I mean uh, uh, Athens. It seems remains um, trapped between, on the one hand, the kind of self-imposed uh, projection of um, past glory and the antiquity uh, that has been uh, brought into the country through the strangers, of course, who came to look at ancient monuments and through the 19th century this process of uh, consolidation of the uh, classic ideal took place on political level and became a kind of like a social glue making the new nation of Greece. So uh, the nation building and, and the, the, the neoclassic uh, with, it, with, with its institutions too, such as academy, library and so forth, all these neoclassical buildings built by German and Danish architects in Athens in order to build the nation. So this is, this is something that we're going to be uh, busy with. And also the fact that after Arnold Bode, who was a mo modernist painter, was not allowed to paint anymore, um, this house has hosted exhibitions of German art in which Parthenon, uh, as a, in the Grosse Deutsche Kunstausstellung, Parthenon appeared often and uh, Erechtheion as well appeared very often. So we, we're going to bring examples of this bad and good uh, neoclassic spirit that, that keeps um, appearing. So between the two venues, about how many artists are you looking at? Will the artists in Athens recur Yes. in, in Castle? Yeah. Okay. The, each artist was invited to um, to visit both cities, first Athens and then Kassel, and then to, to make a proposal for, for each city. And in most cases, we end up um, with the same artists present in both cities. In some cases, we decided that it did not make sense to, to show the same work again in another city, or it was so specific to the context that one of the two cities sort of fell out of, of the picture. But, um, it's it's going to be a kind of structure of repetitions and echoes and so forth. Okay, I, I just wanted to, you know, because you have a very large, um, sh yeah. should I call it curatorial team or collaborators? Yeah, yeah, I, don't, yeah. I don't quite know yeah, what a title for them. No, it's a team, yes. It's a team. I, I would and, say and, so. And can you sort of talk a little bit about how you work with this group and, mm. and uh, you know, what the, the, the process of bringing things together because I know already a project, you've already started a project with the, the cinema project that is currently running. So what... It's a television project. A television project, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, we, we are... Um, we have a kind of documenta um, broadcast on second channel of Greek uh, national television and it's the television that was closed down by the previous government and um, brought back into existence by the current left-wing government as a kind of programmatic uh, move. And on this television we, we run every Monday, uh, quite late in the night, uh, a kind of uh, a program called Kimena or Texts, where we show um, documentaries and art films and all, all kinds of things that were usually uh, completely out of this kind of uh, format, uh, so uh, state television. Um, yeah. Okay. I, I just want to talk a little bit about the, you know, the, the, the you know, this series of magazines. Um, you, need, you know, earlier I was asking you why um, the you started with issue number six um, uh, of the magazine, and I didn't quite realize the the reasons behind it. Can you, you know, talk about this project because it's been so central mm -hmm. to disseminating. Um, many of your ideas and many of the artists who participate in the exhibition have contributed and, and so on. And why was this magazine important you know, for, for, for you? <clears throat> On the one hand, it was a kind of egoistic uh, 
uh, I just, you know, we, we wanted to, to read all these texts. Uh, we, we wanted to commission them and read them all. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's a learning process for the entire team, actually. The magazine is not a kind of tool of enlightenment for bringing the knowledge to the people, but it's also, uh, I mean, we are the first readers. So the magazine is shaping uh, the concept of the exhibition. The exhibition in the very beginning did not have a, a kind of thematic premise. It had a kind of structural move in it uh, of this bilocation and many consequences of this move, but it did not formulate, for, formulate its uh, themes or su subjects. And I think uh, quite a lot of, uh, of this process happened uh, on the pages of this magazine for the last uh, two years now. Yeah, so, and you, you mentioned uh, Madame Minuhin's, um, mm -hmm. you know, tower. Yeah, of, uh, of, well, it's a Parthenon. Uh, Parthenon. Yeah, it's a one to one yeah. replica of Parthenon that is going to be built on Friedrichsplatz in Kassel. Yeah. And this Parthenon is clad in books, and these books are uh, those that were banned in different countries during uh, different, you know, moments in history. The work was first realized in. Yeah, it is. Uh, in 1983 in Buenos Aires as a, as a sort of scaled down uh, Parthenon which featured books that were banned during the period of dictatorship in Argentina and Marta proposed to do it now and include books from all over the world so a, a new version but the reason why we thought about it for the Friedrichsplatz is also that Friedericianum was once a library so it was a library, and also the book burnings took place on Friedrichsplatz. So this place is very much um, related to books, yeah, the, the, the books, the knowledge. Uh, and, and the original function of Friedericianum as a, as a museum, which is basically like a resource uh, at, during the Enlightenment mm. for producing uh, knowledge. Mm. So, so maybe that uh, brought us to, to the idea of, of building the department on, among other things. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah, it is. Okay, so the the, 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 the team and yeah, the, uh, the, 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 the kind of think tank that is building. There's um, one, one team divided between two cities and um, I invited a number of uh, curators and curatorial advisors because I was interested in the specific uh, knowledge or, or competence that they bring into the project, mm. s rather than uh, in kind of repackaging um, things that I learned while I was working at Kunsthalle and elsewhere. So of course some of these artists and a lot of the issues that I was busy with at Kunsthalle will somehow manifest themselves in Documenta, but but I was truly interested in bringing other uh, kinds of knowledge. Um, and therefore, uh, we have, I think, six curators um, and, and a couple of curatorial advisors uh, who have been rather active. So, okay. mm -hmm. no, so maybe you can talk a little bit about the, some of the projects that you've commissioned for, for South. Mm. And you know we we we're going through um, you know the pages and uh, you know you know for me um, you know the, the delight in looking at these pages um, it, you know is predicated on the fact that um, you know there's an incredible you know number of um, important texts or so the relationship between the thinking. And the artwork and the uh, the relationship between um, you know projects and speculations around them is really you know you know quite fantastic. How might one be able to experience some of these uh, projects in mm. in the exhibition, or are they not related mm. you know to the exhibition? Yeah, I I, I think I think you will be um, able to to relate each text basically published in this magazine to something that you will see or find in the exhibition. Mm. I'm pretty sure about it. Like in the first issue we featured a conversation I did with uh, American art historian Alexander Albero and German artist Maria Eichhorn and another German artist Hans Hacke. 
and we try to speak about the issues of provenance in relation to what we call the indelible presence of the Gurlit estate. Um, so, for, for instance, there was a block of materials in, in, the, in that issue that, that related to, to Gurlit estate, including some more remote or associative um, uh, ref references, such as the text by Stefan Zweig called The Invisible Collection, which is a de description of a visit of an art dealer to his former uh, client during the period of um, economic depression in the late 1920s, while um, in the meantime the collector uh, who owns a substantial um, al album of very fine prints uh, got blind and uh, he's showing nevertheless to the, to the art dealer this this album and describing every, uh, each and every etching that is in it, mm. but he doesn't realize that in the meantime his family sold these etchings one by one because of the economic hardship of the time, so he's basically showing empty pages mm. and invoking only from his memory all these artworks by, say, Rubens or Rembrandt and the likes. So we thought about that in, in relation, for instance, to the still invisibility of, of the works that were buried for many years in the Gurlitt estate, mm. um, and so forth. I mean, th this magazine could be, it can be read, but it can be also, uh, let's say, commented as a kind of curatorial uh, undertaking, mm. I, th I think. So it, it does contain something that I hope the exhibition will be also able to, um, to, tra to transport or to, to put into practice, perhaps? Well, if, if there's one word that I could use for the, what you've described <coughs> so far, thinking about the exhibition, the evocation, Stephen Zweig, you know, um, Goethe, Gulit, and Bode, and so on, it, the, the word will be, you know, there's a, a, a form of hauntology, so to speak. There's a haunting. You know, the, the exhibition, in a sense, is giving us an idea of specters that you are invoking. Why is that? Why, you know, do you think that this is what you are, you know, trying to transport through the exhibition? Yes, I like the word hauntology. <laughs> It's a pleasant word, but I think what we, I don't know, we, 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 we're trying to do justice to things that seem to repressed or absent. I think this is the primary meaning of, of making exhibitions, it's bringing things to light or to, you know, bringing them into kind of relative obscurity and not keeping things in, in, um, in, in a safe, safe place in some kind of safe deposit of history. So it's activating different parts of history from different angles. And maybe it's what name Moya Men in this work uh, commissioned for South called a flow in the algorithm of cosmopolitanism. He, he says here, I search for footnotes. Uh, so it's cer maybe searching for footnotes. It's not the main text, it's always annotations footnotes, uh, cross-references, and so forth. We are not proposing any um, unified kind of muscular narration in this exhibition. I think we're going to look at things from um, a, as a kind of interpolation of, of uh, many viewpoints that, that, that are produced by living outside of the main place mm. that well, interests us. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, you know, you know. Perhaps it, it might be in, interesting to 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 shift to 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 the history of Documenta because what you seem, you know, to have laid out it, 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 it is the fact that there are two documenters in a sense. You know, um, you know, to borrow your term, one might say, uh, okay, let me go back to say that when. I went to Berlin to interview for Documenta in 1998. Um, I had the hubris to say that there are three periods in Documenta. Three? Three. Okay. And the, 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 the first is the annual body years, 
55 to 68. And that obviously came to a conclusion with the, 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 you know, the notion that there could be no grand narratives and the kind of you know, exhibition project that the return of the avant-garde and of, and, of, and of course the idea of the timeliness of contemporary art. And the second period, I thought, began with Harold Zeman in 72. And here, the subjectivity of the curator was being constructed. And there's a kind of self-consciousness about you know, the, the, you know, the exhibition, the curatorial, as a text, you know, something to be written, something to be you know, explicated. And, and I thought that you know, that project came to a conclusion in 1997. And, you know, and lo and behold, could you believe when the third period started? With me. <laughs> And, and I was saying that not because, you know, the, the, there were no affinities between Documenta 10 and 11 with Catherine David's Documenta, but I thought that this Catherine David's, you know, project was in a sense, you know, both in terms of the, the design of the logo, the D with an X, you know, crossed out that she, she wanted, and this was her statement, she wanted that documenta to end after 97, that, that it was finished project. And the, and, the, and the point was the attempt to resurrect it. But it seems to me now that we, you know, we are no longer in three or four periods, we are now only two periods if we follow what you've said. And that is the neoclassical documenta of you know, Bode and the, um, and the likes of Zeman. and there is a kind of generational shift and that Catherine Davis' documenta may well be the onset of the second period. And there's a link, a sort of relay between documenta 10 to documenta 14. And the idea being the documenta is no longer, you know, an exhibition, but is constructed as an event. An event that in which the exhibition plays one role, but not the absolute role. So Catherine Davies, 100 Days and 100 Guests, our platforms in you know, different you know, continents, of course, Roger Bogle's magazine project, and you know, uh, Carolyn Christo Bakagiev's um, you know, other projects. And here we are. You know, um, you know, with, with yours, a bifurcated, bilocated, you know, documenta. Um, what do you think that this shift is signaling in terms of the construction of um, a large-scale exhibition? Do you see documenta as being unique in this sense? Um, is this a heritage that we can sort of to think about that is a contribution to the um, Curatorial, to curatorial knowledge, as it were. Yes, I, uh, <clears throat> I think uh, f since 1997, uh, um, th there is a kind of re reflexive turn in in documenta, and um, it starts to ask a question: what What is an exhibition? So it starts to ask um, about the condition in which it is produced, about the tools that it's using. It's becoming like a, an exercise in self-awareness of what this exhibition means and what it, uh, what else it, it could mean. So each next is an attempt. To, uh, it's a kind of revisionist um, uh, vertigo in a way from which it's very difficult to go back on a straight path of just exhibition making again um, because um, it's, it's always an attempt to kind of like re reposition this or, or, or somehow repurpose uh, the tool. And, and I think that this is what these four uh, otherwise quite different um, editions have in common. And in terms of Documenta 10 heralding s s some of what was present in yours, I'm thinking mostly about the, especially I'm thinking about the program of 100 Days, 100 Guests, mm. where certain figures appear who were previously have not been known to the world of arts, mm. let's say in, in, in Europe uh, uh, at all, um, they were kind of untypically brought into a dialogue with contemporary art. 
And uh, I, I think that this is this is something that uh, then accelerated and kind of expanded in 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 Documenta. So the kind of uh, idea of uh, the public programming, um, which is almost as important as uh, the objects in the exhibition or uh, durational pieces in the exhibition or performance in the exhibition. Yes. So um, I, j just just to, to ask before I open it up to. Um, the audience for a few, you know, you know, you know, questions. Um, what do you want to be the compensation for having made this effort? For you, of coming to Munich? No. <laughs> We're a poor institution. You know, I should yeah, I really be in a big building. No, I'm thinking, you know, curatorial, intellectually, and so on, to sort of to, um, you know, of course, the, 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 the exhibition, um, you know, has not opened, but it, it's, it seems absolutely clear that it will be uh, an amazing and exciting project from everything that I've seen inside here, and so on. But, so, but for you, you know, we, 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 as the, you know, viewing public will go and, we will have different entry points into it, and you know we we will we'll, we'll try to maximize the gain um, of 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 our you know journeys to Athens and, and Castle. But for you, you know, what sort of compensation do you seek? Hmm. Um, I, I thought what, what I proposed was close to impossible, and it was kind of addressing this. Impossibility, and uh, in particular, it was addressing quite uh, uh, painful and uh, rather tangled r relationship historically and at present between Germany and and Greece, for instance, and also considering Athens as a passport toto of of the other others, uh, so places that are far away from from Europe and that can be somehow seen as if in a mi mirror in Athens. And I think for me the the greatest uh, let's say uh, co uh, compensation or rather uh, gratification of of my efforts and the efforts of uh, in the meantime some two, 200 or more people who have been working day and night for uh, years now would be to to see that it's possible uh, to to make this exhibition in Athens and in Kassel not as a um, megalomaniac uh, kind of achievement, but as a way of uh, putting into practice a lot of per pertinent questions about what, what we are now experiencing in, in, in Europe and uh, what we can perceive in Europe from what is happening in other places too, uh, I guess. So uh, putting this into, uh, into action in a place like Athens would be, um, you know, it would be sufficient uh, compensation, I suppose, uh, before the exhibition opens in Castle. Please help me thank Adam. <laughs>